That's great. Oh, okay, then since it's 10.06, I will go ahead and call the meeting to order since we're <laughs> ready to go. <laughs> okay, we'll start with the minutes of the last meeting. Jim, it's all yours. All right. President Jack Baker called the Goins State District Carriage Association meeting to order at 10.05 a.m. with 12 members present virtually via Zoom. Secretary Jim Terry read the minutes of the September 19th, 2020 meeting, and they were approved as read. David Hampton read the treasurer's report. Total monies as of October 17th, 2020 is $12,963. The report was approved as given. Mary Bell Chase presented her Cherokee moment, reading letters from the Georgia Department of Archives and History, Cherokee Letters 1786 to 1883. These included letters from 1819 to return J. Meggs about Cherokees that were going to live on the reservations provided by the treaty. And a letter from a white settler in 1830 to the Georgia governor with in regards to the burning of white settlers' houses by Cherokees. Jack Baker announced the death of Richard Starbuck of the Moravian Archives, who was working on Volume 11, and told us about his Moravian funeral. Dr. Julie L. Reed, Associate History Professor at Penn State, was our featured speaker. Her presentation was Cherokee Uplift in Times of Crisis. Julie also told us about visiting two caves with early Cherokee syllabary that predates sequoias, and how this shows that Cherokee education traditions predate Sequoia and contact with Europeans and boarding schools. President Jack Baker adjourned the meeting at 11.52 a.m. Are there any additions or corrections? If not, I would entertain a motion that we approve the minutes as read. I so move. Is there a second? I second. Okay, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. <laughs> and David, you want to give Ruth's treasurer's report, please? I have Ruth's treasurer's report here. Uh, checking account as of October 17th was $4,329. Dues, $67. Payout to Megaphone Pro Solutions for the web, second half of the new website, $1,400. So the total checking balance now is $2,996. The CD beginning balance was $8,634. The interest earned for one month was $9. The ending CD is $8,643 total of all monies as of November 21st, $11,639. Okay. Are there any questions? If not, the treasury report is approved as given. Okay. So Mary Bell, you have your Cherokee moments. Yes, I do. <laughs> Thanks, Jack. Well, we're all uh, ready. Good morning, everyone. Um, a few years ago, not too many years ago, I'd say maybe two or three, I was interested in finding out, and if some of you may recall this, in finding out when the earliest possible time that a Cherokee chief acknowledged the United States um, Thanksgiving. And of course, I found uh, a proclamation by Lewis Downing, who was chief in 1870. And of course, Chief John Ross, all his documents, I have never gone through a great deal of those. So I couldn't find anything, but I know that Cherokees have always given thanks uh, to the creator for the blessings that they uh, had. And uh, this was probably done through uh, different uh, ceremonies 
and different acknowledgments of the creator that, that they had in the early times. And so I'm going to read to you again the proclamation by the principal chief, Lewis Downing. And this appeared in the Cherokee Advocate of October the 22nd, 1870. Proclamation by the principal chief, a day of fasting and prayer. I, Lewis Downing, principal chief of the Cherokee Nation, do hereby set apart and appoint Thursday, the 17th day of November, 1870, as a day of nation, humiliation, fasting, and prayer. And I do hereby call upon all the people of the Cherokee Nation to observe the same strictly, earnestly, and sincerely. Let Christians of every name throughout the whole nation assemble at their various places of worship and unite in earnest prayer to Almighty God for national preservation. Ask God to incline the hearts of the rulers of the United States to observe strictly their solemn pledges not to trample down our rights and our liberties. And thus preserved, we may become a nation devoted to God, a nation redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, given from under my hand and the seal of the Cherokee Nation at the Executive Department, Tahlequah Cherokee Nation, on this, the 17th day of October, 1870. Lewis Downing, Principal Chief of the Cherokee Nation. And since I first gave that, and incidentally, Luke uh, published that in the um, Cherokee Messenger, and as I mentioned, I, I forget just exactly what year that was. Since that time, I found sort of what I was looking for. And this appeared in the Cherokee Advocate, November the 14th, 1874, when William Potter Ross was principal chief. And the article says, Thanksgiving. Whereas the President of the United States has recommended Thursday the 26th as a day of Thanksgiving and a desire been expressed to me that the people of the Cherokee Nation in view of the gratitude due from them for the manifold blessings they have been permitted to enjoy during the past year should be invited to join in its observance. Now, therefore, I will P. Ross, Principal Chief, do by this proclamation invite all persons within the Cherokee Nation to assemble in their places of worship on Thursday, the 26th day of November, and express their thanks for the mercy and favor of the Almighty God during the past year, and to observe such day as a day of rest, thanksgiving, and prayer. In testimony whereof, I have fixed my name and the seal of the Cherokee Nation at Tahlequah, the seventh day of November, 1874, Will P. Ross, Principal Chief, Alan Ross, secretary. And so this evidently is really the first time that I have found that they joined in with the United States in their uh, observation of, uh, and, uh, of Thanksgiving. And of course, I'd, I'd be interested to know, as I mentioned, uh, anything about Chief John Ross, whatever he had to say. And David, cut me off if I go a little bit too long. Uh, I don't want to go into your program. Um, 
my Cherokee moments is from National Archives microfilm publications, microcopy number 234, roll 73, letters received by the Office of Indian Affairs, 1824 to 1881. Cherokee Agency East, 1829. And the following that I'm going to read to you are important declarations that were submitted in 1829 regarding the United States attempt to establish a true boundary line between the Cherokees and the Creek Indians. And also a few years ago, uh, for my Cherokee moments, I uh, gave some of these declarations then, and I said that I would uh, continue with it. So here it is a few years later that I'm continuing. The Cherokees and the intermarried whites give significant information concerning events as far back as the 1700s. And the first one is Cherokee Nation, the 6th of December, 1829. George Sanders, a half-breed Cherokee, aged about 57 years, states that he was born and raised in the southeastern part of the Cherokee Nation that he has always, since he was grown, been familiar with what was thought to be the line that divided the lands of the Creek Nation from those of the Cherokees as claimed by the Cherokee Nation, and which was as follows. Beginning at the old Cherokee corner, which stands about 25 miles east of the high shoals of the Appalachian, and to run thence to the said high shoals of Appalachia and since a direct line to the mouth of Wills Creek on the Coosa River. This was the understanding of the Cherokees so far as I have always understood it. <clears throat> the above statement is made at the special request of General Coffey, United States Commissioner desiring me to state what I know of the old and true line between the Creeks and the Cherokees, and which is, as I have stated above, according to the best of my knowledge and recollection, I have never known of but one place called the Suwannee Old Town and but one place called Buzzard Roost, and they are both on the Appalachian River and generally known by those names. He further states that his brother, Alexander Sanders, was living at the old Suwannee town on the Chattahoochee River about the year 1807 or 1809. And at the same time, a man by the name of Road Easley, a citizen of Georgia, who formerly had a store at the High Shoals of the Appalachian, and he had a stock of cattle and established a cow pen on the west side of the Appalachian, about four or six miles west of the High Shoals, and settled a stock keeper there that Alexander Sanders and Thomas Woodard, a half-breed Cherokee, raised a company of Cherokees and went to Easley's cow pen and drove off the family and burnt the improvements as being on Cherokee land. He thinks this took place 21 or 22 years ago. And George Sanders uh, made his mark at the end of this document. James Daniel, late, one of the judges of the Cherokee courts in the Cherokee Nation, aged 40 years, has been raised in the southeastern part of the Cherokee Nation, is acquainted on the Appalachian and Chattahoochee Rivers. He thinks the high shoals of Appalachia is nearly about due east 
from the buzzard roost on the Chattahoochee. He knows of the place called Sewanee Old Town on Chattahoochee and the place called Buzzard Roost on the same river. And he never knew of any other places known by those names. He further states that he was educated in Greene County, Georgia. And when there, he has frequently heard the subject of the boundary between the Creeks and the Cherokees mentioned among the white people of that country as running from the high shoals of Appalachia, a direct line to the mouth of Wills Creek on Coosa River. And he always received the same impressions from the Cherokees. Given under my hand in Cherokee Nation, 6th of December, 1829, and James Daniel, um, wrote his signature. The next one is a declaration from John Rogers. And this was December the 9th, 1829 in the Cherokee Nation. I have been acquainted in the Cherokee Nation since the year 1808. And in traveling through the different parts thereof, I was informed by a number of the natives and others that the path leading from the Cherokee Corner on Clark County to the Hog Mountain, thence to Suwanee, thence to Hatawa or Hatawa Old Town was a line between the Creeks and the Cherokees. Sometime after that dispute took place between the two nations. Colonel Road Easley with others was chosen to designate which of the two paths, the Hog Mountain Path or the Stone Mountain Path, both leading to the High Tower Old Town, intersecting with each other within five miles of the Chattahoochee River on the west side, should be the line between them. Colonel Easley decided that the true line should lead from the high shoals on the Appalachian by the Stone Mountain to the shallow ford on the Chattahoochee. And he states that his informant was principally Richard Rowe. And then his uh, declaration, John Rogers declaration is as follows. Near Sewanee Old Town, 9th of December, 1829. I, John Rogers, age 55 years, have resided in the Cherokee Nation 27 years. 25 years of the same, I have lived near this place. Soon after I came to the nation, I married a daughter of Thomas Cordray a Cherokee family that lived then on the Hightower River. The next year after I married, my father-in-law proposed for his whole family to remove and settle on the Chattahoochee River near the Sawana Old Town, where some of his family connections were already living. When the proposition was made, I inquired to know if there was no danger of our getting on the creek land. I was answered by the old man and those who knew the country best that there was no danger for the creek line run with a trail or path that passed near the stone mountain called the High Tower Trail. We removed and settled near this and have remained here ever since. And I never heard the Cherokees acknowledge any other line but the one I have mentioned. But I have never been correctly informed which of the two paths was went by the name of the High Tower Path. There was one which led from the High Shoals of the Appalachia by the northern part of the Stone Mountain to the Shallow Ford on Chattahoochee and the other run from the same place by the foot of the Stone Mountain on the south side and to the standing peach tree on the Chattahoochee. 
Both of these paths were called high tower paths, but which of them was considered the one, I never knew. In addition to many others who I've heard speak of the above line, I particularly heard it from Colonel Road Easley, who was an old Indian trader and who informed me that the chiefs of the two nations had agreed upon the same at a treaty that was held near Fort Wilkinson about the year 1802 when General Wilkinson and General Pickens were commissioners. I have no knowledge of the two nations ever having agreed upon line west of the Chattahoochee River until the line was marked from the Buzzard Roost to the mouth of Wills Creek about the year 1822. There has never been any Creek Indians living on the Chattahoochee River since I lived here higher up the river than the lower end of Sandtown, which is 16 miles below the standing beech tree. I never knew any other place called Sewanee Old Town, but the one near this place, nor but the one called Buzzard Roost. And John Rogers uh, wrote his actual uh, signature. And he, uh, this was sworn to and subscribed uh, before me this 9th of December, 1828, Isaac Gilber, Justice of the Peace in Gwinnett County, Georgia. And the next one is quite a lengthy one. And I hope I don't give out on this. Uh, it's Old Red Bank Town, Cherokee Nation, South Side, High Tower River, 10th of December, 1829. John Wright, a white man married to a Cherokee wife, states that he come into this nation when a boy. He does not know his age correctly, but he thinks he was about 12 years of age and he has lived in the country about 47 or eight years, all of which time he has lived on the rivers of the high tower and the last 25 years, he has lived on the south side of the river. The second year after he came to the country, he lived in the high tower town or village. This was about 45 years since. At that time, there was a respectable village at that place. Old Katahuska and Old Terrapin, two principal chiefs of the nation, lived there in the Hatawa village. The Red Bank village was then settled on both sides of the river, and a few Cherokees lived at the Elatuna on the south side of the Hitawa. At the time I first came to the Hitawa village, there was the remains of an improvement of a few Creek families who I, who I was informed had lived there before I came to the country, but they were gone before I knew the place. They were said to have been a hunting party. I never heard of any other Creek Indians living on the waters of the Hatawa to this day, except a few Creek men who came here and married Cherokee wives. About the close of the Revolutionary War, General Andrew Pickens of South Carolina and old General Clark of Georgia marched an army into the Cherokee Nation and penetrated the country as low down the Hatawa and the Ostanala into the latter river. I was then a boy and in the old Hatawa village, the inhabitants of which run and left their town. But they did not cross the river at that place nor attack the Hatawa village. He rec recollects that the Cherokees were settled 
in the Sewanee town on the Chattahoochee about 35 years since as near as he can recollect. recollect. About the time he settled on the south side of the Ottawa near where he now lives. The subject of the line between the Creeks and the Cherokees was frequently mentioned amongst the Cherokees. And he recollects that the Cherokees claimed the land on Appalachia as low as the high shoals. And from there to run out by the Stone Mountain and to the Buzzard Roost on the Chattahoochee. And from there to run westwardly with a ridge that divides the waters that runs into the Ottawa River from those running southwardly, leaving all the waters of the Tallapoosa to the Creek Nation. He never heard of any correct line between the two nations until the line was agreed on and run from Buzzard Roost to the mouth of Wills Creek. Turkey Town on the Coosa River is the lowest down the river where there, wherever has been any Cherokee settlements that he knew of. They settled that place on both sides of the river about 40 years since. About eight or 10 miles below the junction of Ottawa and Estenala in the Turnip, Turnip Mountain Town settled on both sides of the river. That place has been settled about 30 years since. The village of Two Runs, about 10 miles above the fork of the rivers, Ottawa and Estenala, was settled 30 years since. The old Ottawa town on the south side of the river, 20 miles above the junction of the rivers, was settled when I first came to the country 47 or eight years since. The Sixes Village, about 38 miles above the junction of the rivers, was settled on both sides of the river about 30 years since. The Red Bank Village, about six miles above the Sixes, was settled on both sides of the river. The place was settled about two years after he came to the country. Hickory Log Village, two miles above Red Bank has been settled on both sides of the river about 30 years since. The Long Swamp Village, about 12 miles above Hickory Log, was settled on both sides of the river 35 years since. Besides the villages before mentioned, there are several Cherokee families settled and living all through the country out from the river on the south side of the Hatawa as far up and down as the villages are settled. Many years since a man by the name of Blackburn was descending the Coosa River with a quantity of whiskey, as I have been informed, and at Turkey Town, the Indians took his whiskey from him. This I know only by report. I have no re recollection of ever hearing that the Creek Nation claimed the lands on the Ottawa and the Coosa Rivers where the Cherokees were settled. The foregoing statement contains nothing but the truth according to the best of my knowledge and recollection given under my hand the date above and John Ra uh, Wright uh, made his mark and it was sworn to and subscribed before me the 14th of December 1829 Walter Adair judge of the circuit court of the upper circuit Cherokee nation and how am I doing David So, I think it's been about 30 minutes. Has that been about 30? Close to that. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll, uh, I had more, but, <laughs> but I'll save that for another time. Okay.
Okay. Yeah, David and I had agreed on on thirty minutes that I would give my Cherokee moments. So that concludes my Cherokee moments for this morning. Thank you. Appreciate it, Bill. You name lots of our Cherokee ancestors in there. Oh, were, were, well, were some of you related? Know. Were some of you related to those people? Yeah. Because the, the Sanders and the Wright was married into the Downing family. and Curtis is descended from the George Sanders you mentioned. Yep. Right. I think well, I thought all that was really very interesting. And I wish that I'd had a good map because I was really wanting to see exactly where each and every place was that they mentioned. I'm not sure about that. Jack may know more about it, but I'm thinking <laughs> was trying to figure out what the value was because they were getting ready to treat with the creeks. Is that right, Jack? Yes, it was. And they wanted to know what land they were going to be getting when the creeks gave theirs up. Right. And doesn't this give us a lot of clarity, Jack, about when the people came down after the revolutionary era of fighting and had to move further to the south where they settled? I mean, that does. And because there's, well, there's a whole series of those. There's a large number, as Mary Bell had mentioned. And there, Thomas Pettit gives one, and he talks about his mother was the Nanny Downing, the granddaughter of the John Downing, the trader. And he talks about he and his mother coming down, which would have been the Nanny Downing during the Revolutionary War. Yes, I gave that his declaration uh, in pre in previous Cherokee right. moments. His and Caleb Starr and some of the other old timers. Yeah, that's my ancestor, Thomas Downing. So, and some of it's up towards Patsy's. Pit it, really. pit it. I know, that's what I recognized it. Yeah. Okay. I was curious about the location of Stone Mountain that they kept referring to. I think that's in Atlanta, just east of Atlanta. Well, I know where Stone Mountain, what we call Stone Mountain today, is that. Yes. I didn't realize is that the Stone the Mountain. Yes. I didn't realize the creek land came that far east. Yes, it is. Okay, been there many times. Yeah. So, Jim, did you have a presentation for us? You're you're on mute, Jim. Okay, can everyone hear me now? Yeah. yeah. Yes. All right. As I've uh, been researching my Rattling Gourd ancestors, I've used ancestriesnewspapers.com to, to look up what I could find. And um, I'm going to read a couple of articles about Looney Rattling Gourd, who was the son of Jackson Rattling Gourd and um, L.C. or Alice Wilson. Uh, the first one I'm going to read comes from the Springfield News Leader, January the 6th, 1915. And it's titled, Cherokee is the oldest printer in Oklahoma. Tahlequah, Oklahoma, January 5th. A man who is in his 87th year and is quite probably the oldest compositor in the state of Oklahoma is residing at this place. He bears the name Looney R. Gord and is a Cherokee of nearly full blood. 70 years ago, or in September 1844, the first number of Cherokee advocates was issued from a printing office in this town. For many years, the capital of the Cherokee Nation. The Advocate, which was established by an act of the Cherokee National Council, was printed in both English letters and Cherokee characters invented in 1823 by Sequoia or George Guess, to whom a statue is soon to be placed in Statuary Hall at Washington. 
One of the advocate's first apprentices was Looney R. Gord, then a youth of some 16 or 17 years. The foreman of the composing room was a man of practical experience and his Indian charges made excellent progress and Gord remained in the advocate office for some time after the term of his apprenticeship had expired. But early in the 50s, the wonderful stories of California gold reached the far distant land of the Cherokees and a number of young men in the best families became afflicted with the gold fever to such an extent that a great company departed for the valley of the mountains of California. Gord was, a number, was of the number and spent a number of years in the gold state. So like most of his countrymen, he failed to become a crisis with a with a Libyan ruler who was quite wealthy back about 500 BC. <laughs> Eventually he returned to his native land and for years lived a few miles from Tahlequah, engaging in farming and stock raising, becoming surrounded by the comforts in life and being established in a nice home. But with advancing years, he eventually gave up this occupation of farming and removed to town. There's a Another article I found that talks about this, it was printed in 1919 in the Wichita, Kansas Daily Eagle. Um, I'm, I'm not going to read all the article because it basically covers a lot of, of the same material, but I am going to read a, a couple of interesting extra things that I found in that article. Um, it talks about the conditions that he he worked in and in the office and about how there was 85 boxes in the cases that contained the Cherokee type uh, and how the apprentices mastered the instructions of the foreman and improved their skills and typesetting. Um, at the end of the article, I'll, I'll just read this paragraph. Gord was one of the few men who remembered the great all Indian council held in the public square at Tahlequah in the fall of 1843, when delegates from 21 Indian nations and tribes assembled. Many of the Cherokee youths who entered the old printing office fell victim to consumption induced by the confinement, but Gord experienced no ill effects and all his life was remarkably strong and active. Um, these give us some interesting details about his life. And I also found in this same collection, when you research a name, you have to realize that you're gonna get all kinds of newspaper articles for people with similar names. And I found out there was, uh, there's at least three Looney Rattling Gordons that I'm aware of, and they were all cousins. And that's gonna be, the subject of my next presentation I'll do in the next month or so um, about another Looney Rattling Gord. That's my presentation for today. Appreciate that, Jim. That was very interesting. <clears throat> it gives us some good information about the early advocate office, too. Yeah. Okay. So David, are you ready for yours? Yeah, I'm going to tell you about why I prepared this. Let me make sure I can share my screen here with you. Um, There you are. Can you all see my screen here? Yes. 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 Okay. Great. Uh, 
A friend of mine, Michael Stopp, works now for Leadership uh, Oklahoma, which is, a, I think, a group of young people who who get selected as future leaders of Oklahoma. And they're an alumni association of people that are have been in the or have been selected in the past. And he asked me to speak at their meeting a couple of weeks ago about genealogy. So I agreed to do so, but they were really strict on time and things didn't go technically very well. I was not able to share my screen with them. And uh, I got cut off after about half of the presentation, which is about 20 minutes. And because they wanted me to have, t have 10 minutes for questioning. And of course I had to answer questions from the wannabes. So anyway, I thought I should give this talk here at least once. <laughs> <laughs> I changed it here and put Going Snake instead of Leadership Oklahoma. Uh, but this is a talk, it's really about basic genealogy and a little bit about uh, Cherokee genealogy. Uh, I'll say <laughs> first, the definition of uh, <coughs> genealogy is the study of ancestry and family history and the records created from such study. And I would add myself to the definition that it must be studied in conjunction with history during the lifetime of the persons being researched. Over 100 years ago, genealogy was thought of by most people as a snobbish hobby, mainly for the interest of those wishing to show descent from famous people or join prestigious societies like the Daughters of the American Revolution. Now, like most disciplines, genealogy has changed a lot over the last 100 years. In 1977, the book Roots by Alex Haley and its accompanying widely watched TV movie created a great interest in genealogy. And I wanna begin here by reviewing some important genealogical and historical organizations and societies. And I'll briefly mention just three, although there are literally hundreds of which Going Snake is one. The National Genealogical Society was founded in 1903 and it continues today with an emphasis on documentation of findings. The Genealogical Society of Utah was established in 1894 as an arm of the LDS or Mormon Church. It began microfilming records in the U.S. County Courthouses in 1938 and in international repositories in 1946. For over 50 years, it has generally not been necessary to travel to various courthouses to look at records, but rather to visit the Family History Library in Salt Lake, where copies of those records are easily accessible on microfilm and now in digital form. I have been to the research library over 20 times to research holdings. The first time was in 1982, and the last time was in 2005. Now, FamilySearch.com has replaced the Genealogical so uh, Society in 1998 and started digitizing its microfilm records and making them available online, as many as they can, in accordance with the agreements made by the providing entities. They also have a group of thousands of volunteers who index these records, making searching much easier for the researcher. Here is an example of a marriage license for my great-great-grandparents in Union County, Georgia in 1848, uh, which is online. Uh, the records that I'm gonna show in this presentation will generally relate to that couple. The, in Oklahoma, genealogy research has been concentrated in the resources of the Oklahoma Historical Society, founded in 1893, which has an extensive collection of Oklahoma records. This is the first place that I ever went to do serious research in 1967. At that time, it was in the Wiley Post building. At that time, the Oklahoma Historical Society was the only place in Oklahoma that had microfilm of all of the U.S. Census records. 
OHS also has been instrumental in developing an important repository of Oklahoma newspapers. Approximately 95% of all newspapers ever published in Oklahoma are available today in digital media at the Oklahoma Historical Society. For most of that time that I have been doing genealogy since 1961, I recognized that newspapers were a great untapped resource for genealogical data. But with the onset of digitization and optical character recognition to allow indexes, that continues to improve. And finding information about persons in newspapers of an unknown day is now becoming possible. Uh, Jim gave you an example of that when he talked about finding articles about Looney Rattling Board and in Springfield, Missouri and Wichita, Kansas newspapers. Nearly all of the Oklahoma newspapers prior to 1923 have been digitized and are available online for research. Now to begin research in one's ancestors, it's important to start with what you know and what your close family knows. This is somewhat less important today than 100 years ago because of the records being kept now. In 1920, very few people had birth certificates and most deaths were not recorded. So now it is, is uh, likely to locate births and deaths kept by various states in the past century. When I began recording, I had four grandparents, two great-grandparents, brothers of two other great-grandparents, and a sister of a great, great grandparent living. So that was a huge beginning toward filling out a pedigree chart. This was the last time in 1986, this chart here, that I actually started putting rec or keeping records on paper. And I can tell the day that I kept, that I prepared this chart because my grandfather, Thomas Marion Hampton, died on March the 23rd that year. And my grandmother, died on March the, 20, uh, March the 29th. However, I do not have her date. I'm, I don't mean March, I mean May the 29th. And I don't have her date listed here. So sometime between March and May was when I prepared this document. But it was about that time when I first got a computer program. And so all of my records have been kept on there since then. Now, when you began to look at records, American research usually starts with U.S. Census from 1790 to the current. A census from 1790 to 1840 only lists the names of the head of the household and group the other members into gender and age categories. Starting with the 1850 census, the name of every person, their age and birthplace has been listed. Census records have been available on microfilm for many years, but you would have to travel to a repository to view the films, like the Oklahoma Historical Society. You had to know what county you wanted to find your ancestor, and then look page by page on the microfilm reader. It was a time-consuming process. However, for over 10 years, digitized copies of the census have been available online in many places, and have generally been well indexed by FamilySearch or Ancestry.com and other websites, making it to po possible to find someone in just a few minutes. Census records are not public until after uh, 72 years. So the 1940 census is the last one currently available for public research. The 1950 census will become public in April of 2022. This is an example from the 1900 census of my great great grandparents that we saw their marriage license earlier. They were living in the Cherokee Nation. At that time, there was a separate schedule in the bottom for uh, Native peoples. So it gives more information than it does for the average uh, American citizen. Now, when I started to research my ancestors in 1961, one of the first things I discovered was my descent from Nancy Ward, a prominent Cherokee woman who died around 1820. This was because of an article written about my 
great great grandfather and his ancestors by Dr. Emmett Starr published in a Tahlequah newspaper in 1916 that had been handed down into my family. Nancy Ward has gotten a lot more publicity over the years. And in 1994, we've formed an organization of her descendants of which there are tens of thousands living today. And of course, Becky Hobbs and her co-playwright Nick Squeed have a great musical about her that, that's being presented periodically. Musician Becky Hobbs from Bartlesville has written a musical about her life called Nanya He, the story of Nancy Ward, has been performed many times over the past 10 years and gotten great reviews. Now, because Michael Stopp had asked me to do this presentation, I pulled out a picture here, uh, a scene from the musical in 2014. Now, the musical has a lot of license for fictionalization in the drama, but, but it's been kept uh, as historically accurate as it can be. And here's a view of Michael Stopp as Cherokee War Chief O'Connor Michelle Honecker as Nanya E, and uh, Dice Dawson as uh, Governor William Littleton. Now my Cherokee descent has channeled me into specializing for the past 20 years in Cherokee genealogies. For over 10 years, I've done genealogy reports for the Cherokee Nation Remember the Removal Bike Riders. I also uh, work writing biographies and genealogies for the Oklahoma chapter of the Trail of Tears Association when it honors those who came on the trail by marking their graves. Now, no one can honestly say that she specializes in Native American genealogy because every one of the 574 federally recognized tribes has a different set of records to review for genealogical purposes. For the majority of Natives in Oklahoma who descend from citizens of one of the five tribes, one of the most important records are the Dawes records. The Dawes Commission did its work from 1893 until 1914. It had two tasks, to determine who were the citizens of the tribes and to allot the tribal lands to those citizens, making sure that specifically the tribe around their homestead was allotted to them. It was a monumental task. The native tribes owned their land in common. Improvements such as houses, barns, fences were privately owned and could be sold, but the land itself belonged to the tribe. And if unused or abandoned, was available to any tribal citizen for improvement. We often hear stories today from many persons who claim that their ancestors were eligible for enrollment, but did not enroll for various reasons. This is not true. The commission made a strenuous attempt to determine who the citizens were and forcibly uh, enroll them and allot land to them if necessary by getting information from relatives and neighbors. Now I have looked at literally thousands of Cherokee enrollments and I'm only aware of two Cherokee adults who should have been enrolled but were not. Now we've talked about the continued expansion of online digital public and private records and adding more newspaper scans with OCR capabilities. But one more thing is changing genealogy, and that's DNA. Even over the past few years, DNA research has changed and is quickly becoming a way to verify paper trail research for the past couple of hundred years. It, its importance will continue to grow as more and more people get themselves DNA tested. Now here's the first page of my DNA matches uh, on ancestry.com. Uh, and you can see people there suggesting our first cousins, actually only the first two are my first cousins. The third and fourth one are my first cousins once removed. The next, next one, OM, and, and the one after that, Esteline Dalmage, are first cousins of my father. But on Ancestry.com, I have over 100,000 matches, only with about, I would say, 1% that I can tell what the relationship is. 
Okay, that's the end of my presentation. If anybody has any questions, I'll be happy to answer.